Hello viewers, on the occasion of 75th anniversary of Indian independence, today we would like to share with you about the unsung heroes of the freedom struggle against British rule in Northeast India. You may know one or two of them, but let's see if you know them all. So without further ado, let me share the stories of Gengi Megu of Adis from Arunachal Pradesh, Kumdhar Kumar of Ahom Kingdom in Assam, Prince Narendrajit of Maitri Kingdom of Manipur, Yu Kyang Nangba of Jayantias from Meghalaya, Chief Benkoya of Salem from Mizoram, Subeda Narendra Chetri of Gorkha Army from Sikkim, Shanti Bhushan of Agartala, Tripura, and the brave villagers of Kikruma from Nagaland. Let's start from the northernmost part of the Northeast India, Arunachal Pradesh. She has many indigenous tribes with innumerable brave sons of soil. Adis of Arunachal Pradesh had been raising strong resistance against the British East India Company as early as 1836. Just a decade later, from the Treaty of Yandapu, the Company Raj, after getting access to previously peaceful hilly terrains of Adis, planned an oppressive campaign known as the Arbor Expedition of 1893 to 1894. They advanced from Sadia to Dambuk with an ulterior motive to subjugate war arbors of Dambro. On the way to Dambuk, the British forces were met with tough resistance at Pomchir, Dambuk and Siluk. Here, they took advantage of their guns and trained elephants. One of the villagers Lutnyung Megu of Siluk sacrificed his life to save his fellow villagers. Consequently, the villages of Sili and Padu allowed the forces advance unhindered so that they will be, be confronted at Pimbu Dota on 25th February 1894 with the full-fledged assault from Adi fighters led by many heroes including the legendary archer Kengi Megu. Supported by the British records, the popular oral history reveals that among the three marchers, Kenki Meku was the most renowned archer. He shot down many sepoys and seriously wounded Lieutenant East with a poison arrow. He led from the front and laid down his life while displaying absolute bravery and patriotism. Now, we will move down south to Assam and seven decades back into its relative past to know the first resistance against the East India Company's rule in the region post-1826. After the Treaty of Yandabu, the British East India Company exercised their expansionist plan to bring one of the longest surviving Ahom Kingdom in Assam within the Company Raj. Born in the royal clans of Ahom Kingdom, Gumdhor Kumar was fiercely independent by nature and could, could not ignore the calling for the freedom of his motherland. He was the first Ahom royal freedom fighter who not only challenged the British occupation and oppression by gathering the forces and ranks from the curtailed Ahom administration but also inspired Asmi society for many generations to come. As for the Ahom traditions, Gumdhar Kumar was honored as the new king in the presence of many high-ranking officials, including two British allies and 18 village headmen. King Gumdhar then prepared for a long battle in which many to be martyred joined him, notably Yali Pukul, the first differently able freedom fighter in the Indian independence. Being a visionary, the king Gumdhar kept his camp at his house known as Nokochari Gaon, which was strategically located near Noga Hills. On the night of 20th November, the British troops, led by Lieutenant H. Rutherford, stormed the house of King Gumdhar to capture him. Luckily, he could escape the seizure by taking refuge in the Naga Hills, along with two of his sisters, while his elderly mother was left behind. After taking the house filled with the documents on the planned revolt, 
Rutherford cunningly said to the old mother, Where is your son king? Bring him. We will make him the real king. Hear, hearing this promise and fearing bloodshed, the innocent mother sent a messenger to King Gunther to return. Heeding his mother's call, Gunther returned home, but fell in the treacherous trap of the British lieutenant. Even though Gunther was arrested, he successfully inspired many of his followers who later set the biggest armory in Sipsagar ablaze, resulting in substantial damage to the British gunpowder. Now going eastward to Kingdom of Manipur, that has also been affected by the same Treaty of Yandabu and British East India Company's aggression. A Manipuri prince, Sana Chahi Ahom, also known as Prince Narendrajit, son of Maharaja Chorjit, was also sent to Kalapani in 1858 for leading the Sepoy Mutiny, popularly known as the First War of Indian Independence, at Kachar, Barak Valley of Assam. It was mentioned in the reports of Captain Stewart, who himself, as the superintendent of Kassar, was actively involved in containing the mutiny led by Prince Narendraji. He showed great leadership in gathering the mutineers and skillfully avenged the unfair treatment of his fathers by the British East India Company. He led the soldiers of 34th Native Infantry in Chittagong to fight the Battle of Latu on 8 December 1857, killing Major Bean, the leader of the British troops. Later, Prince Narendrajit was arrested by Manipuri army under the influence of the British East India Company, but then King of Manipur Chandrakriti Singh freed Narendrajit after learning that the revolt was not for the throne of Manipur, but for his patriotism. Narendrajit was a unifying legend who could bring many tribes and ethnic groups under his command, who would not hesitate making the king the ultimate sacrifice. He planted the seeds of true nationalism and anti-colonial sentiments over and above the customs of caste, creed, and religion in the revolutionary soldiers of 1857. With the same fire of Sepoy Revolt of 1857, another flame was burning in the western front of the Northeast, the Jantia Hills of Meghalaya. The year 1857 is still fresh in the minds of the Goras. After all, it has been just five years since their invincibility was challenged. Little did they know that the Jaintia people will rise up once again. January 1862 sees Ukyang Nangba unleash a brilliant guerrilla tactic. He is aware that rulers have the power in the form of ammunition and guns, so his men build stockades arms, firearms, and store grains. On January 20th, the police station at Jawai was destroyed. Armed with a pistol, rifle, and a sword, warriors moved from one village to the another, rallying the people towards their cause. Shadowy figures like Nangba moved quietly and they followed him. However, after his capture, as he was being taken to the gallows on the evening of December 30, 1862. Ukyan said something prophetic. Brothers and sisters, please look carefully on my face when I die on the gallows. If my face turns towards the east, my country will be free from the foreign yokes in the next hundred years. And if it turns west, it will remain in bondage for good. He died facing east. Less than a century later, India became independent. Like the Native American Indians, Wu Qiang fought for the rights of the people in the face of imposition of an alien way of life and values. People of Kasi and Jaintia Hills have since lost much of their traditional culture. In fact, not many in the younger generation even remember Wu Qiang. To the south, in the Lusai hills of Mizoram, 
Bezos were becoming impatient with the British tyranny, which destroyed their age-old practices and beliefs of one such Mizo. According to geologist H.T. Lal Ramsanga of Mizoram University, the British considered Ben Kuyai and his men as uncivilized headhunters because of his raids on tea gardens adjoining Assam. But he contributed a lot to conservation. An asylum bird sanctuary was established because of his influence over his people. The first Lusai raid recorded in the British governed Assam was in 1826. From that year to 1850, the local officers were unable to restrain the fierce attacks of the hillmen on the, on the south. Raids and outrages were of yearly occurrence, and on one occasion, the magistrate of Silet reported a series of massacres by cookies in what was alleged to be a British territory, in which 150 persons had been killed. The most severe raid was in 1871, when a series of attacks caused several deaths on both sides, with extensive damage on plantations, a number of workers and soldiers were taken prisoners, and among them a six-year-old Mary Winchester. Miss Winchester was taken a hostage by Benquia's warriors, while the other prisoners were executed on the way. Even though Mary was returned with honor later by Benquia, he still remained a formidable opposition to British occupation. Crisscrossing again, to the northwestern part from where came another brave fighter. The first Gorkhali freedom fighter to die for India, Subeda Niranjan Singh Chetri, led the contingent of native Gorkhali soldiers for revolutionary Manipuri hero Juvraj Tikendrajit Singh. When East India Company was taking over different parts of India, bit by bit, and entered Manipur, the Manipuri hero Jubraj B. Trikandajit Singh decided to fight against the British, then to surrender. Much like Mongol Singh and Rani Dakshmibai, Jubraj Trikandajit became a martyr too. Till this day, the Gurkhalis of India remember, salute and celebrate the brave heart Subedar Niranjan Singh Chetri, who was hanged by the British in 1891 for his role in the revolt of Manipur. His bravery and patriotism were unparalleled, yet his story of valor and glory, much like other acts of patriotism from the rest of the Northeast India, was lost in the pages of history. These were his last words. My birthplace is my motherland. I am ready to die for this land, and I am ready to kill for this land, but I am not ready to accept surrender and subjugation of my land. Keeping the legacy alive in the southern state of Tripura, another revolutionary kept it going into the 20th century chapters. Shantipushan was inspired by Surya Sen, popularly known as Master Da, one of the most noticeable freedom fighters who was mastermind of the Chittagong Armory Movement in 1930. Master Da formed a rebel group to raid the weapon store of British administration there. For being one of the rebels, Shantibhushan served 10 years in jail imprisonment from 1930 and during that time he had completed his BA from the jail. He was a school student when he joined Master Das rebel group. He took an active part in the armory movement. During the fight, one bullet stuck in his forehead without harming him. The injury mark was in his forehead till his last days. He was in his deathbed in GPB hospital when the then chief minister Sukhamoy Chen Gupta handed over the Tamra Patra in 1972. Back in those days, centuries ago, many countless brave hearts were pleading for the call from their motherland. Many may have left this world with the hope that we will fight for them, to keep it free as they had with their lives.
to make it a better world as they had tried. Here is such a story from the most untouched and remote village in Nagaland. The 1851 Battle of Kikruma fought between spear-wielding Naga warriors and rifle-totting British troops remained a story little known outside Kikruma. The villagers of Kikruma have long preserved in their traditional way of storytelling the de details of what happened, which they narrate with pride. These details match few accounts of the battle pinned down by the British officers such as Major John Butler, who filed the Kikruma onslaught in his travels and adventures in the province of Assam during the residence of 14 years in 1855 as one of the most bloody battles ever fought in Assam. While clashes between Naga villages and colonial forces were many, what makes the Battle of Kikruma different and especially worth retelling is that, is that this battle was not the outcome of colonial forces seeking to attack and subdue the village. As they had reduced to rubble and burned down many other Naga villages, but because Kikruma warriors had openly challenged the British troops troop to a fight. This is the story of a single Naga village deciding to challenge the British Empire. As you have seen, the northeastern region of India had their share of India's struggle for independence right from the start, with many more stories of valorous sacrifices made since two centuries ago, when there was an enemy at their doorsteps people of Northeast India always stood united for freedom and justice, leaving behind their religious, ethnic and cultural differences. We hope that the present generation of Indians will acknowledge their contribution to the Indian independence from the British rule spanning over centuries and at the same time be inspired by the proven fact that unity thrives in diversity, especially in Northeast India. Thank you.